The world of data analysis continues to explode. This includes the sporting world. Professional teams have access to multiple data generating devices, GPS trackers, video analysis, injury lists, statistics, and even weather data. So how can teams correlate this data and get the most out of their investment in technology? Outstat Analytics is the solution you're looking for. A central platform for crunching, analyzing, and visualizing all your data in one place. Outstat Analytics is built on a powerful cloud-based big data engine, available anywhere in the world. You can upload or integrate data feeds from any source, quickly ingest your data, and start analyzing. Training is readily available for all levels of users. Contact us for more information so we can help you collect, analyze, and win. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know we have people joining us from all over the world today, which is super exciting. My name is Sean, and I'd like to welcome you to ASTAT's third webinar that we've done. Um, for those of you who aren't yet familiar, ASTAT is a cloud-based web application and data management platform. So that provides all levels of rugby team with the ability to easily enter on-field statistics using predefined fields and can analyze your data in real time. So before we get started, I just want to kind of run down quick agenda for the webinar for the hour. Um, firstly, the ASTAT team is going to be giving you a brief demo of our free ASTAT application. And then, of course, Coach Mitch is going to hop on to answer some previously submitted questions. Um, so before we hear from Coach Mitch, we're going to show you the app, how easy it is to create organizations and teams. Um, we have been doing a lot of upgrades, um, so we're hoping to release a new version in the next coming weeks. Um, so really excited about all the new updates. Carmen is going to give you a sneak peek of the newest version of the Asset app. So I'd like to welcome Carmen. Good morning, and thank you, Sean, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and I'm going to take you through the app quite quickly. All right, so here we have the home screen. Okay, so once you've registered, this is the first thing that you're going to see once you've logged in. Right, so the ASTAT, well, ASTAT as a whole is comprised of these four components that we see on the screen. Um, the first thing I'm going to mention is ASTAT analytics. And this section is uh, more for professional teams that are already collecting large sums of data. We have the ASTAT University as well, or ASTAT U. And this allows players, coaches, um, it gives them access to thousands of data science and data analysis courses. We've also got the ASTAT data sharing, um, which we will touch on a little bit later during the webinar. And then um, when creating the ASTAT application itself, we had community and amateur teams in mind. And this is a free feature, so that's pretty cool. So I'm going to go ahead and show you more about what the ASTAT app is all about. So once you've registered, the first thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to create an organization by clicking on Create Organization. So you would fill in the details and then click on submit. I've done so already, and I've created an organization called St. John's College. Right, so within the organization, you would then specify which sports are participated within that organization. So I've selected field hockey, rugby, and soccer for this, um, for St. John's College. For each sport, you can create a league by clicking on create new league. I'm gonna go ahead and select the St. John's Rugby League. Within the league, you can then create different teams by clicking on the Create New Team tab. I'm gonna select this team which I've already created. Okay, once you have got your team created, you can then invite users to the team and there are different role levels. You can invite somebody as team admin um, to manage the team, an analyst or players to the team as well. Once you've done this, you're gonna go ahead and click on Data Entry and you're gonna create a season for that team by clicking on create new season. You fill in the details, start and end date of the season and you click on create. I've done so already, so I'm gonna go over to my active seasons. You select the season that you've created previously. I'm gonna select winter and you will see a list of fixtures which you've created within that season. Once you get to this page, you can then fill out the roster for each game or you can go straight to the game dashboard. But I'm not gonna go into any detail over here as my colleague Brayden, he's gonna to touch on that a little bit later in the webinar. Um, and I'm gonna end there for now. So thank you, Sean, back to you. 
Thanks, Carmen. I love all the logos, gives it that little pop. Um, but thank you so much. So yeah, if you guys want an account created, you can just today send your email in the chat selection here. Um, and then once the newest version is released, we can definitely send you guys all uh, login credentials. So um, well, anyways, before we introduce the man of the hour, I did want to let everybody know that we're going to try to take two or three bonus questions from the Q&A section of this webinar. So if you guys want to go ahead, please submit those um, and we'll try to get those um, at the end once we've gone through all our questions. Anyways, without further ado, Coach Mitch has one of the most impressive resumes in sports. Mitch has carved out a wonderful coaching career on four continents. He is a highly sought after rugby mind known for his out of the box innovation. Coach Mitch is the youngest All Blacks coach in history, finishing with an 88% win record during his tenure. He also led the USA to their first major title since 1924, the ARC in 2017. Also in 2017, he led the USA to a historic RWC qualification. For the first time, the Eagles qualified as the top North American side in Rugby World Cup history. Coach Mitch also helped England reach the final of the 2019 Rugby World Cup. And as if that isn't impressive enough, a little fun fact we learned recently was that Mitch was also a junior international basketball player where he played for New Zealand against Australia. So without further ado, welcome Coach Mitch. Thank you, Sean. Hey, hey. I like your, is that a Christmas sweater we have going on? Uh, yeah, just a, a bit of a Christmas jersey day or jumper uh, day in, in, in England here. So uh, um, yeah, just hiding away from my lunch. Um, uh, so yeah, it's quite fitting, I guess. Well, thanks for fitting us in. I love the festiveness. I feel underdressed now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, our street is um, it's amazing how the neighbours uh, all put the lights on and um, all the different uh, different Christmas decorations and stuff. So yeah, there's a real spirit starting to together before Christmas. I love it. So good. Um, well, yeah. So we do have some questions for you. I don't know if you wanted to. Um, get right into those, or yeah, no, I think that the, the most important thing is that for people that are on board is to, for them to um, to express themselves and what's on their mind, and and um, those who are, who are currently involved in coaching teams or, or athletes, um, um, how I can help them, and, and conversely, yeah. I'm sure every every person um, that has coached or um, has, has got has had challenges, um, and ultimately. Uh, I think we have all the same challenges. Uh, it doesn't matter what level we're at. Um, they all just come at different times. And just uh, the great thing about coaching is that somebody always knows or has an idea or a solution that you often sometimes don't have. So, and and then generally, sometimes it's actually within the within the athlete himself or herself that that's often got the solution as well. So there's just so many different ways to coach. Um, there's no wrong way or right way, but it's. Um, uh, ultimately, if you can be yourself, um, um, I think that's the most the number one important thing is that there's only one of you. And you've just got to find a way uh, within your art and your craft to be uh, to be the best you can be um, in order to help somebody to become better than what they are. For sure. Yeah, we definitely got a lot of good questions from coaches just kind of looking for your advice. So um, that kind of leads us into that. So um, if I can start off with the questions, our number one was, what was your plan with the USA Eagles? Yeah, my plan, it's, it's interesting, it's a really good question because when I first got the opportunity to, to do it, um, the, the common the common theme that most Tier 2 uh, rugby countries have is that um, you'll be reliant on overseas players, you'll have to bring them back in order to be competitive um, because the domestic models um, are not supplying you know, the, the talent or the ability uh, for guys to to jump at the level really quickly and, and dominate. So I got told that, you know, you'll be relying on 70% overseas players and 30% domestic. And, and so I just chucked a question out there really quickly um, to the people involved um, around, so what about if we change this from uh, around to 70% domestic and, and rely on 30% um, overseas? So we just come up with a tactical prioritization um, try to optimize the regulation nine windows as much as we could so that we could get at least 10 days preparation before, before a test match. Um, we wanted to create a competi healthy competition between overseas and domestic players. Um, and then we wanted to reward the guys that were meeting sta the standards 
domestically. So really, the overseas players in the end, you know, I, you know, I can't say their intentions were to come home and see family and use it as much as a as an air ticket or a, a, or use the the, the preparation as a like a, a barbarian style. So we changed all that mindset by basically creating accountability around standards. Um, had a particular type of periodization that we thought was uh, important to us. And one in terms of how we wanted to play the game, but to um, play and train uh, the game above the demands that we that we don't normally get domestically. And um, it was a slow it was a slow traction in the first year. We sort of started to get some traction, I think, in the in the second year, uh, and that started to show in the results, and also started to show in the enjoyment. Uh, of the players and then the, the domestic players became, um, I guess, a lot stronger uh, mentally um, uh, and also became a lot hungrier as well because they could see that the hard work they were putting in, in um, was, was getting the reward. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, so, yeah, we have a couple more good questions. This question is from Neil Turner. Um, looks like you guys had met at a Rotana Memorial game. So his question is, as a grassroots coach, how can I improve my coaching and progress to senior side amateur rugby? I'm level two and up to date with the RFU CPDs. Um, it really depends on what type of coach you you are, what type of personality you are. I think if you're um, a strong presenter, um, you're able to hold a group really, really well, then use your Use your own personality um, along with with evidence um, to produce what you what you want to do. Um, uh, if your player group has has got um, uh, good strengths in it, and there are people that you can empower to to coach with you in terms of getting the concepts across in the way that you want to play, then I would by all means try and use that. The more that you can elicit um, questions and check for understanding. Um, amongst your players uh, as you progress uh, and build your, your ways, of, uh, parts of the way that you're going to play uh, is important. So there's just so many different ways um, ways to do it. Um, so for me, it's more about where his strengths lie, make sure he stays within those strengths, but at some point he's going to have to elicit questions, he's going to have to uh, check for understanding, he's going to have to retrieve what they understand because this younger generation, because there's so much that comes past them, and they and keep it simple. Um, sometimes you can only really get one point across in each, in each area of the game, um, and that may also require that you only concentrate on one part of the part of the game on a in, in a session to be able to get your end point. Um, whatever your end point is in a session, um, just just be explicit about that about what you're after and. And what we're looking to to end by uh, end with by the end of the session, then that gives you a really good opportunity for it to land. Um, but never take it for granted that it will land. And also check on um, before you go on to the next stage, just check for understanding and retrieve the information from the previous session, and that'll help you grow um, grow the team. I think um, uh, pretty quickly. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks, Neil, for that question. That was a good one. Um, and then also, so in the beginning, obviously, I kind of touched on some of your career highlights, but what are some of your career highlights that are special to you? Um, do you think as a player or as a coach, um, the, um, I, I, uh, I guess coming from a basketball family, I, um, uh, my mum was a, a coach in marching, actually, a marching girls. Um, so uh, I guess I, I probably got a little bit of the genes from my mum. Um, the uh, dad was a, a competitor, but mum was probably um, a better sportswoman in uh, in, to- in total. But you know, to have a boyhood uh, of basically watching mum and dad play sport in a tournament, and, a, and then for us boys to be able to get a chance to shoot hoops after after a, uh, the end of a tournament was probably the best part of life. You know, like um, and then going to boarding school. As much as I probably didn't like it on the early stages, um, to be able to come out of your dormitory um, and to be able to just shoot hoops uh, in my spare time was uh, was, was was fantastic. Um, and then um, I don't think you get a choice about 
who comes past you and and can influence you in your career. So I was really fortunate to have a couple of American coaches, basketball coaches, come past me and teach me some you know really good fundamentals uh, about the game. And I guess that was really helpful because as much as you're guided by your parents, I think you really do need an influence outside of your family to be able to um, to ground you, to mentor you, to, to for you to look at things in a in a in another way. Um, and then for some reason, I just got hardworking genes for some reason. I don't know, like I just put my head down. I wasn't as gifted as my brother. Uh, I wasn't as talented as him. Um, but I just used to put the work in. And and once I gained my confidence, um, then that was, uh, that was, you know, why basketball intuitively sat with me really well. But then I chose rugby. I just stopped on my fit mate scooter one day. Um, I went and played, um, rugby. And then my basketball coach in the National League and, and the New Zealand juniors said to me, look, you seem to be having a, a few, uh, bruises and bumps and scars on you that I don't normally see in you. And, um, he, uh, he kind of um, told me um, that you, you, you're obviously playing rugby, so you're going to have to make a choice. So I hopped him off that mate's scooter. Uh, went to a rugby club in, called Fraser Tech um, in Hamilton. And uh, our first World Cup Championship was won in, um, not, well, not long after, a couple of years. And that, that really stands out. Um, and then obviously Captain Waikato to a to sort of top of Auckland eventually and uh, after Auckland and dominate New Zealand rugby for a decade in the uh, in the eighties, um, to to have all three major trophies and that in that time was like um, something surpassed or something surpassed my um, uh, goals and then to eventually become an all black at twenty nine. Uh, and fulfill that dream of playing for your country, um, captaining your country was like uh, huge. Coaching wise, um, well, I just think over time, um, while you're really ambitious and you're quite mindful of achievement, and you're a younger coach, I think the older you get, um, you just got to learn to take the good with the bad, uh, or work your way through the tough. And, um, and just seeing players and teams, um, eventually uh, achieve, um, as a result of, you know, the, the, the hard work and the, and the challenges and the up and downs um, of, a, of a tournament or a, or a competition, to me, just seeing smile on, smile on their faces of achievement, and then the dis- and, then, and then also learning from the observations of disappointment as well. Um, not only just after a big big match, but um, uh, or you know after a big tournament where something's at stake, it's, it's really uh, awesome, I think, to watch your, the behaviour of your players um, post a, a match, whether you win, lose, or draw. Uh, I think it informs you enormously about personality and their, and their drive in terms of how they want to play the game and, and where they're at to, to move on to the next week's preparation and, and performance. Perfect. Yeah, that's interesting to learn about your family, kind of. It sounds like that determination, competitive edge was sort of passed along to all you guys. So, um, yeah, that's great to learn. Thank you. Um, our next question is, what is your advice for a coach trying to turn around an underperforming team, and do you have any advice <coughs> on how to motivate players today? Um, an underperforming team, actually I'm in a situation like that right at the minute with, uh, with Wasps, um, uh, where everyone's making excuses around the amount of injuries we've got, but at the end of the day, uh, it's still our responsibility as coaches to create cohesion and, and get that winning performance. So it's even more challenging when you've got younger talent um, and talent that's surfacing and playing at a level that probably is a lot earlier than expected. So I'm in that situation at the moment, and um, I'm certainly trying to encourage my head coach and the younger coaches within the environment to to go back to the principles um, that we that we established and and even reduce the amount of um, Amount of stuff that we get after, so make it, you know, one point that we're going to get after an attack and defense, really dumb it down. Um, and you're going to, and, and also ride the development of the athlete as well. So try not get, get into, um, trying to correct players' decisions, um, or their actions, I should say, um, and their decisions, um, because it sometimes in a spiral, you're trying to get performances. 
because they tend to see it as judgment. So you've got to be really, really careful how you frame and communicate. You've got to be really, really careful about yeah the the, the language that comes out of your out of your mouth um, during tough times, and got to be really, really clear. Um, so clarity um, often brings energy. Uh, you still need to make sure that you yeah, that you own the, the training methodology, and it needs to be strong. Um, you still got to um, be very, very strong on the on the basics, um, so that you uh, get a shift in a shift in behaviour. And at the end of the day, you as a coach, you own the, you own the standards, um, and the players own the decisions. So don't get in the road of their decisions um, because you don't want them to. To, to not have the intent to have a go. Um, so it's very, very important to make sure that yeah, the standards are clear. And it's almost like you have to spiral up the spiral around up the core of your game model. Um, whatever your game model is and whatever the principles that substantiate that game model, I think you need to make sure that you retrieve, revisit those things and make it as clear as possible about what you're, what you're trying to achieve um, um, as a team. And, and get them to feel and visualize um, the fun and the way that they can express themselves with them within that model as well. Okay, perfect. Um, well, yeah, now might be a good time to maybe transition um, into some analytics. So um, we will go ahead and introduce Brayden. He's going to finish that application demo so he can dive into the data sharing um, and the roster components. So I will welcome on Brayden to give us the rest of that. Hey, Brayden. Hey, everybody. How are you? Thanks so much. Uh, thanks for the introduction. It's great. Um, I'm doing perfect today. I'm excited to be able to show you what the rest of the app has in store here. So let me share my screen with you. Hold on a second. You're not in your suit and tie today. <laughs> no, not not like in this picture. Obviously, it's a little, no. a little bit changed since then. Um, right. So I will go to my team here in a second. This is exactly where Carmen left off for you, those of you who don't know. And um, so I'll just get started here. I chose NFL football. I'm a big NFL guy. You can see NFL behind me, college football. Um, so I'll go to my roster tab first. Here's where you have the ability to enter all your players for that game. And the cool thing about this, too, is say these fields are all blank. You can just pull from the previous game, and it will automatically populate those fields. So if I go back to our data sharing this is where the you have the ability to enter your data points in your game so we have four different tabs here the offense defense special teams penalties and again this is just for the nfl so there's going to be different ones for the other sports as well probably more tabs and what's cool about this is if you do say justin fields gets a touchdown i can tag him from that game and it will automatically go to his player card in the data sharing tab so if i hit submit the score is going to automatically change and say i mess up i can just go to the subtract button and then it'll go away and the score will change as well but i will go to the data sharing tab here again we have team data sharing and player card from the team data sharing tab this is where you have the ability to add videos, um, at stat data, documents, etc. And they'll come here. That's not just any link. It can be any link, not just YouTube. If I go back again to the player card, this is what it's going to look like exactly on the player's end. So Justin Fields, again, sees his touchdown pass there. With that said, um, we're very excited to see what you guys think in the upcoming weeks here. And... Um, I'm going to pass it back to Sean. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thanks for including my New England Patriots on there. <laughs> Much appreciated. I had to do it for you. I know. I appreciate that. Boston girl appreciates you. All right. Well, thank you, Brayden. Uh, yeah, we're excited to kind of see this roll out in the next couple of weeks. So thanks. Hello. Back again. Hey. Hello. Apologize for the technical um, problem. No worries. It sounded like they were gearing up for a good party. I heard some glasses and... Uh, Sounds like you'll have a good night. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was in the quietest part of the building, but um, you know, a, a, a large group do. Yeah. Love it. Well, cool. Yeah, welcome back. Um, yeah, so I guess if you want to kind of take the floor before we answer some more questions, if you have anything to touch on that we haven't got to. No, I think the previous question was in relation to 
uh, when you're going through a, a challenging time with your team and you're trying to get get them out of a tough period. Um, and the other thing too is outcome can put a lot of pressure on people. So um, if you've got clear principles, a clear game model, a clear um, strong tactical periodization, um, and you kind of like uh, understand where your where your athletes are at, you know, emotionally um, and and physically. Um, then it's just a matter of making sure that you're very, very clear on um, in terms of how you want to play, keep it really simple because ultimately they'll, they'll bring you the energy. Um, I just find that the more that the ways that I get it wrong and the teams that I've been associated with when we get it wrong is that generally it's when we've, we've tried to put too much information into them, um, which leads to them overthinking. And they and they don't bring the energy uh, in terms of their intention, um, and they become hesitant. Um, so yeah, there's uh, there's no real um, answer to it, um, but that seems to be over over time been the um, the one thing I seem to go back to when I'm making adjustments is uh, those are the things that sort of like spring to mind. Okay, yeah, kind of interesting that you were kind of going through that now with one of your teams, so. Um, yeah, that definitely helped. Um, I think too, we wanted to, we kind of just finished off while you were gone, just um, showing the rest of the application with, um, you know, the data sharing, things like that. Can you speak to analytics evolution in rugby from kind of where you started as a coach and today? Cool. Um, now, yeah, now, you, now you're, I'm showing my age. Like um, if I go back to 19, 97 um i bought a banker's book like an accountant's book and i used to have two vhs's um and i used to have the game on one obviously on one vhs and then i used to tape from that to another vhs and then i used to try and do tackle quality uh ball carry quality presentation um all those sorts of things i used to do that numerically and with my own qualitative sort of like scoring system. Um, and then I used to give or present to the coaching group or the head coach as well um, with England back then, um, uh, Sir Clive Woodward. I used to present um, that on a Monday. So you can imagine my, my Sundays were pretty full in creating this information. But um, what it was good for was that when I, I was, the areas that I was strong in, I was able to, um, evaluate and, and, and clearly um, be able to communicate that effectively on, on what I, and, and drill that going into the next week. But then the parts of the game that I wasn't so strong on. Um, so now, you know, like you've got, uh, we currently use sports code. Um, and um, I think I've got to a stage in life where I know what I'm looking for. Um, metrics, uh, game winning metrics are important to me. Um, got a got a, an, an idea of, that if you do win these particular metrics, that you know you've got a good chance of um, of, of winning games. Um, things like you know kick meters, running meters, um, less rucks, um, basically less rucks from the opposition. How many times you get into the opposition's twenty-two? How many times you convert? Um, turnovers conceded and penalties conceded. They're all factors that that determine performance uh, or a winning performance. And then um, um, there's a, David Hadfield's a very a long time uh, New Zealand rugby sports psychologist. And um, yeah, I've known him for, for a while now. In actual fact, I spent time with him when I, when I came out of uh, the All Blacks um, and he was invaluable to me at that particular time um, as I was being quite tough on myself after the performance and the results. And um, he taught me, he's, uh, something that's lived with me with him is that when you're selling something to a rugby team is that you must, um, what is it that you're selling? Um, why is it you're selling it? And if you get those two things right first, then the want to do it will uh, be a lot, a lot easier. Whereas as coaches, a lot of us coaches, we tend to go into the what and how too quickly. Um, and I've been guilty of that. 
Um, but yeah, so the why it is it requires evidence. So analytics and rugby um, are going to are going to play are starting to play a major part, and they'll play even more of a major part um, as the game progresses. So to me, you, you've got to have evidence to to back up the, what you're trying what you're trying to do. And if you get the what and the why it is. Uh, pretty spot on. You know, I think you've got a really good chance of um, exciting your group to to get after it. Perfect. Yeah, I think at Asdad, I think it was all created, you know, for any level of rugby teams um, to help, you know, even um, like kids that are interested in analytics and things, you know, it definitely gives, gives a good broad range. You know, obviously we have kind of more like our premium offering for professional teams that are using it, but also you know, for people that are just interested in analytics and kind of spark something else. So it's, 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 it's interesting you say that as well as that, like the number of analysts, rugby analysts that have come across that either had early injuries um, mm -hmm. or they've actually loved the game, but they've never been big enough or strong enough or athletic enough to, to play the game. So to me, um, you know, like um, there's always got to be somebody in your school or in your community um, or your or your rugby, your rugby um, support that loves the game in such a way that yeah they, they, there's just another way that they can play a role. Um, like it's interesting, a couple of the guys that I've recently worked with uh, at England, um, I think they've they've got to the stage, and they're young men. Um, they've got to the stage where I think they can actually coach now. Um, that's how that's how good they are. Like, um, but that's all come from. From a uh, you know the seeds of playing it when they were younger, um, got injured, couldn't do it anymore. Probably realised that they couldn't progress any further. Um, probably in their wildest dreams, never even thought they could coach situations. But they're they're probably at that point in their in their um, early, you know, mid twenties and in early thirties. So yeah, there, there's definitely a place in rugby um, for for those kind of, kind of people. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and there's. I think analytics just help. There's more way, more than one way to love the game, and um, I think that that speaks good to that. So, um, cool. Yeah. Thank you. What is the most important lesson you've learned in your career? It's kind of a big uh, one, but yeah, the most important lesson I've probably learned is is to is to be yourself um, and to put others first. Really. Um, the more ambitious and, and attached that you get to wanting to win something, probably the less likely that you'll win it. Um, the more that you, um, one, be yourself, um, and two, is put the other person first, which then helps you listen to them, um, knowing who they are, um, and, then that, and then knowing their strengths as a result of knowing who they are. Uh, gives you a, a great chance to 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 make it very clear, and and I think sometimes we just put too much on athletes to to do, um, just identify their strengths, stay on those strengths, and then you know when they are are getting to a point where they where they need to shift in performance, then um, if you know them well, then you'll be able to find a way, um, either through rapport, um, either through certainty of of evidence. Um, or you'll you'll know what motivates them in order to 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 progress. Yeah, I need to remember your advice about it's not about winning when I'm playing beer pong. So I think I'm just gonna replay that in my head. Sometimes I can take the fun out of it when I uh, really <laughs> want to win. So I'll try to remember your words. Um, cool, thanks. Uh, so another question that we got was, who is the best player you have coached? Um. Well, that's a that's that's a really tough question. question. Yeah, yeah. A really <laughs> tough question. But um, the, probably the two people that there's two people that stand out, and one was more successful in terms of team team achievement. Um, but I was very fortunate to select Richie McCaw, um, select him for his first test. Uh, he probably stood out stood out at that particular time. Um, he, bearing in mind, he dropped his first carry in Test Rugby against Ireland, and he went on to get player of the match. But I remember him having a quiet beer with him afterwards, the, uh, after the game. And he was already at 20 years of age asking how 
we, we, not just himself, how we could prepare better for, for our next test. Um, so that was like uh, really insightful. And the, and the way that he just carried on um, testing, testing, uh, yeah, like or interpreting um, the breakdown laws to, um, to optimize the, those to the best of his, um, his skill set. And then there was David Pocock from Australia. He was a 17 year old that I introduced to um, Super Rugby um, and just his um, desire to work. Um, so Richie's sort of like probably tactical and preparation intelligence. And then um, David's, David's ability to, to present himself in the best possible condition um, and, and train to a point that, you know, like that was always going to give him, you know, the greatest confidence to, to feel prepared. Um, yeah, uh, yeah that, those are the two guys that stick out for me and both have, um, different strengths, but, you know, one, one, obviously one guy went on to be successful, uh, during a period, but, you know, both have had to endure a tough, tough times as well. We like David. I think that couple of knees um, and Richie, you know, missed out on two World Cups before he got to. So um, yeah, it just goes to show it doesn't, doesn't come easy regardless of how good you are. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you've obviously coached lots and lots of good players, but we appreciate you picking those two. Um, so our next question is from Quentin. There seems to be more barriers of entry for those who didn't play the sport professionally. What advice do you have for young coaches who didn't play professional rugby but want to be a professional coach? Yeah, I think there used to be in the game, um, probably I wouldn't be sitting here now talking to you guys if I, maybe if I didn't become an All Black. Um, I probably wouldn't have got the inroads to coaching and stuff, but Ultimately, when you look back, it's it's no different. You just got to um, be able to get started, um, show your passion. You've definitely got to clearly have some success uh, as well, um, and then just continue to be process driven, and then and then kind of like see if you can associate yourself with somebody who's who's better than what you are. Um, that gives you an entry, whether that's a small entry, a small role if you can get into, into, into that role um, with, a, with a reputable coach then, and then are able to demonstrate your skill sets um, and look to, um, I guess, become better and collaborative as a, as, as a coach, then I think that'll open windows. You know, like just to do qualifications and things like that is one thing, but I think, um, uh, and then coaching on your own, but um, just go out of your way, try and create a network, um, try and tap into some, um, some elite coach that possibly can give you, um, give you some time. Um, and then you never know. Wow, perfect. Yeah, that was a good question. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we also have a question from Coach Anda from South Africa. He said, with your success with the Lions and the Bulls in South Africa, what was the key to your success and focus slash coaching points? Um, I think I identified very quickly that both teams, um, uh, or yeah, both teams were basically needing of a, a strong training methodology. Um, yeah, with the Lions, I probably drove that extremely, extremely hard and it was extremely disciplined. In, in, in that area um, and then um, uh, probably when we wanted to take the next level um, I probably should have understood uh, where, where, where they're at um, physically and mentally because they gave so much to get to that point um, in order to take this the next stage and then uh, at the balls, yeah, it had a strong and it needed a strong training methodology, um, but also it, uh, the program needed to to also be uh, challenged and uh, probably reprogrammed. Um, so uh, in the first year, it's always messy uh, when you're having to restructure 
um, and then basically look to uh, implement a, a new plan. Um, so yeah, it always takes time because you've got to get to know everyone. You've got to possibly pick up on the agendas and the old behaviours and who's who's driving that. And then I think the hardest the hardest thing is getting the consistency in the language in the in the, in the way that you want to play the game um, because you're obviously inheriting a previous previous systems, previous language and previous ways of, of doing things. So the first year is really, really hard. I seem to have um, always liked those kind of challenges. Um, sometimes you're not the bearer of your fruit either because you're, you, you have to create change. Um, I've never been afraid to create change. I think the older I've got, I've learned how to communicate more effectively through change, um, which has allowed me to guess, um, um, allowed me to have stronger relationships during change, whereas previously, I think, um, because I was so hell-bent on creating change, um, at times I probably um, destroyed some of my relationships uh, through an effective communication. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so our last submitted question um, from Jason McConnell. How do you make sure you keep growing as a coach yourself? Yeah. Um, how do I do that? Uh, one, stay in touch with other coaches that are at the same level, um, who are in different roles. Um, I've currently uh, gone back into attack um, at, at elite level, um, which is allowing me to grow my defense coaching even even better. So um, bear in mind, I started off as a, as a, as a forwards coach because that's all I knew coming out of been in, in the game as a forward uh, my referencing was totally uh, related to being uh, to being a forward um, then I went to coach uh, when I came out of the All Blacks I coached um, attack and um, and also the Waikato back line um, so if you if you want to be a head coach I think it's uh, really advisable to to um, one not uh, over specialize uh, find time to go into the other areas of the game and then make sure that um, in advance into going those areas, you've got networks um, that actually have got a really good information uh, and are able to share uh, in confidence about the, those areas of the games or the particular areas of the game that you're not, you're not so good in or need knowledge in. So that's one way. Um, watching other people present, um, uh, listening to teachers, I think um, you know some of the best coaches in the world um, uh, come from a teaching background. Uh, I always wanted to become a physical education teacher, but my biology mark, um, I blew that in my last year. And so I've gone about it the other way and I've had to learn the hard way. So yeah, learning how to, how to teach um, helps your coaching. Um, you know, how can you create create a uh, bit of teaching, bit of communication. How can you retrieve information? How can you check for understanding? You know, we've got a generation now where there's so much information going past them that you're, um, you, you're not certain that things will land um, or be taken in. Um, so, and also um, I think the other way is learning, learning how to be creative, um, whether that's info, through infographics, whether that's through movie, whether that's through you um, having to um, be vulnerable and, and do something stupid to get a message across, whatever it may be to make people laugh um, or prick their ears up to, 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 to find a way for, for something to land. You just got to just gotta find, find a way which, uh, which suits your group or um, what, what you think is right for that, for that moment. Um, I think that, and that goes back to being authentic as well. Um, don't, don't be afraid to be vulnerable, to show vulnerability. Don't be afraid to dress up and, and, and create an act that's going to get a message across, you know, whatever way you can get the message across, um, then, then try it. Um, ultimately, if you try it, then you, you're going to learn from it anyway, because no, no particular way uh, uh, that you do uh, is going to be the exact way and there's always a way to do it better after you've done it so um, I think as as coaches sometimes we get too set in our ways 
um, in terms of how we want to communicate, how we want to present. Um, and ultimately, that will, over time, bore the players and they'll become less engaged. Um, so, yeah, is I just love the way we are able to coach these days compared to when I when I first started. Um, this the world's your oyster, I think, in many ways. Yeah, that's awesome. Sounds like you just always got to put your own spin on it, per se. Um, so we did grab a couple of bonus questions from the chat, if you have some time. Um, we sure. got a question for, would you consider passing some rugby innovations in other sports like football for the NFL? Um, I watch I watch NFL. I watched actually uh, last year's, um, do you call it a grand final? A uh, Super Bowl, isn't it? Super Bowl, yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. Super Bowl. Um, and I watched it and I think, um, is it the Chiefs? created um, really good defense that day against the, the quarterback. And the quarterback had, um, he has the ability to jump, you know, jump out of the pocket of the defense left and right. But he had a particular habit that he was, or behavior that he was really, really good if he could go to the left. Um, so this team forced him so much more to the right to pick up his receivers and his assists and all that kind of stuff. And it was really intriguing how that plan worked for them. Um, and again, it just goes down to, the, I guess, the parallels uh, of that is how do you take away a strong running nine? How do you take a, away a, a 10 that, that, that wants time and space to be able to run, pass and kick? And then, you know, like teams that kick a lot um, are generally probably easier to put pressure on than a, than a team that has high run meters. So how do you take the run meters uh, and stop them from getting the edge? So for me, um, I, I watch NFL a lot really for on the, on the basis of what the defenses do to try and take away the, take away the strengths of the, of the attacking team. Um, basketball, probably definitely the fast break in basketball reflects say like turnover ball, turnover attack in, in rugby. Um, you know, you've kind of like got three, five seconds to be able to get one or two passes in and, and, and penetrate. Um, uh, so that, that's um, netball. Netball has a has is, has really good, um, you know, close contact skills and agility, side agility. So um, yeah, it's, it's it's generally when I watch other sports, I at some point say if I see something. Can I relate that to to our game? Um, um, it's funny being a coach. Like, you know, when you go and watch other people's games socially or whatever, you, you I must admit, um, my wife probably also realizes this is that at some point I'm consumed about um, what I can learn as a coach or how I can transfer that in, into uh, into into rugby. Yeah, sounds like you're never shutting it off. No, oh, well, that's no. awesome. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure she notices, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, we appreciate that. So um, a couple of people in the audience did want to see a rugby specific example of the app. Um, so we can let you go and kind of get on to your weekend. Do you have any good weekend plans? Uh, yeah, we've got the European Cup um, first round against Munster. It was okay. so... Uh, um, yeah, they're obviously both clubs are rich in, in European rugby history, both having won it before. Um, but Munster definitely, their whole season's built around uh, their DNA is built around um, European Cup. But they're they're also um, having to deal with COVID, having come come back from South Africa and stuff. So um, yeah, it'll be it'll be a really tough fixture. But um, European uh, for those. Uh, listeners and viewers that European, European rugby is probably the close, next closest thing to test rugby. Um, uh, we've got a very young back line out at the moment. Uh, we've got about nine left in our, in our club at the moment with the, with the injuries uh, in the back line. So it's going to be a big test for them. Um, but yeah, looking forward to it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, sounds good. Well, happy Friday, happy holidays to you and your family. We really appreciate you hopping on and uh, we will hopefully talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you, Sean, and thank you, thank you. Um, listeners. Um, I really appreciate it, and have a lovely Christmas. Thank you. See you. Cheers. The world of data analysis continues to explode. This includes the sporting world. Professional teams have access to multiple data-generating devices, GPS trackers, video analysis, injury lists, statistics, and even weather data. 
So how can teams correlate this data and get the most out of their investment in technology? Outstat Analytics is the solution you're looking for. A central platform for crunching, analyzing, and visualizing all your data in one place. Outstat Analytics is built on a powerful cloud-based big data engine, available anywhere in the world. You can upload or integrate data feeds from any source, quickly ingest your data, and start analyzing. Training is readily available for all levels of users. Contact us for more information so we can help you collect, analyze, and win.